So with that, what I want to address in this talk is like three broad topics. First, I want to introduce this notion of the meta, which is a description of sort of the strategic landscape of the game, how people are playing it strategically, as a description of how people play. Then I'm going to talk about this notion of balancing the meta. So we know the game in competition has a strategic landscape, and Hearthstone is a live game that we launch uh, three expansions every year in, so we know that the game keeps changing. And as it changes, that may knock things in or out of balance. And so we'll talk a bit about how uh, our designers think about balance in the game. Oh, man, that would drive me nuts. Uh, uh, especially hearing my own voice right now. Uh, you know, so how do the designers think about balance in the game, and how have we tried to use uh, analysis of live data from the game to inform their decisions there? And then lastly, we'll go into a little bit of a deep dive into some of the tools we've developed for them to be able to understand that game uh, and actually get a sense of the strategies going on. So first off, you know, I've, I've kept saying strategy, et cetera. So what do we mean by the meta? So in Hearthstone, uh, the meta here is the choice of the deck, is what do you put into your deck? Because this is the strategy that you use when you enter a match. And then once you're in a match, down to the sort of tactical layer of executing that strategy as best you can. What these two things show you is on the left, the, the popularity of a bunch of classes. Uh, for all the slides here, I've grabbed uh, data from different time frames and random slices, so it's not necessarily indicative of anything that's happening right now, so much as a, a snapshot of the kind of information our designers have. So this is a good qualitative sense of what they're working with, not necessarily quantitative of what's actually happening in the game right now. So this gives a sense of, for the uh, nine classes in the game, how popular are they in terms of the matches they're actually playing? This is then the actual breakdown into the meta landscape. So for each of these classes, this subdivides into the popularity of different decks and deck archetypes within the game uh, at this point in time. So for example, the Druid makes up about 18 to 19% of the matches we're seeing. And then it, the particular archetype called an aggro druid, which is a very aggressive play style that tries to quickly uh, eliminate the opponent, makes up about 13 to 14% of the matches that we see. Uh, so this is the end goal of all this analysis, right? Is given that all we know from players is the individual decks they all use, we'd like to be able to tell the designers, here's how popular the various strategies are and here's what they look like. So, to get there, you know, the whole point of getting here, like why bother, right, is that we want a healthy meta. So what does healthy mean to the Blizzard designers? There's really three core things they're typically talking about in these conversations. It's a diversity of options, it's a fair game, and it's some fun in the game. Uh, obviously, all of these are hard to ever stick a number to. Diversity tends to be a big driver in these conversations because if things are all the same, the game really has no interesting decision making, and it tends to be, especially as far as their design values go, a relatively dull experience. Uh, this is often the case where a certain deck archetype becomes popular, independent of how powerful it is. Uh, if the community begins to think that one way of playing is the right way to play the game, and that's the only way to play the game, uh, it tends to get really boring, because everybody's doing the same thing and seeing the same thing, and they rapidly get bored of the game. Uh, this is a joke where if you've played Hearthstone, you may have encountered a point in time where all you were facing was a particular archetype of the deck. And uh, even if it's even win rates and completely fair game, it can be very boring to play. So how do we go about balancing the meta, given that we want to achieve these sort of three goals? Well, we want to balance in three main scenarios. One is when the meta gets stagnant. So same decks are popular, and they remain equally popular over time. It's a pretty stable state of the game. Most players start feeling like, you know, there's nothing left for me to do in the game. There's anything I make and do differently. There's certain things that are always going to work and certain ones that aren't. And so there's nothing left for me as a, a player to think about. Uh, fair. Um, certain decks, if they're just so powerful, there's no way to beat them. The designers get concerned because it basically means there's only one right way to play, at least in terms of your odds of winning. Uh, and, you know, players may make gimmick decks and different ways of playing the game to have fun, but it's hard to continue to have fun when you lose every time. And then, of course, the last part is fun. Um, they don't like, the designers don't really want the game to be something where you can win. It is fairly balanced, but it's a very like, stale way to play, either because you can't, all you do is let the deck play itself, or your opponent basically locks you out of playing the game. So there are a number of ways to construct a deck where basically your opponent has no choice or you have no choice in what you do. And so even if that's effective, even if that allows for some competition, 
you basically go into a match and at the beginning already know what's going to happen. And obviously that doesn't feel very fun. And so the designers are very keen to avoid this. So then the question is, how do we do this, right? I may be a data scientist, but the reality is this is about how things get split up. So uh, with that in mind, here's a snippet from uh, a report with, again, arbitrary time frame. So what do we do? What do we want to provide the designers? The first thing is really to give them just this high level information, how popular are different decks and how effective are they? So this is showing you the proportion of all the games that are falling into a particular deck archetype, as well as the win rates of those decks. And we try and keep win rates around 50%. If it gets outside of like 53-ish percent, just to give you a sense of the sensitivity, the designers get pretty angsty. So we don't really like to let the game drift too far from a fair balance at least for the most popular ways of playing. It's okay if there's some outliers on either the very unlikely to win or very likely to win, but if it starts to drift where everybody's doing one thing, that's a problem. Uh, and similarly, we don't want one deck to be the preponderance of all our games. So with this baseline information, we also really want to give them a sense, again, getting back to that, is there fun ways to play against this question, we'll start to look at their opposition. So we'll also look at, given a deck you're playing, this second column here is showing you, given an opposing deck archetype, so you come in with one archetype, your opponent comes in with the other, what are your odds of winning looking like? What are the odds of, uh, and how many games are actually happening there? So many of these are very rare, so for example, well, you know, you're extremely effective uh, using an aggro warrior against a quest mage. You have like an 86% win rate, which is uh, pretty terrible as far as your experience goes as a quest mage. But that's literally 270 games. Very, very tiny fraction of any of the games happening. It just doesn't happen very often. So what this lets the designers do is get a sense both of how are the decks working, as well as how much should they actually be potentially concerned. How frequently are these things happening out in the wild? So rather than relying purely on their intuition or uh, their favorite source of uh, feedback, Reddit, uh, we can actually get useful information on what's happening at the larger scale. So Reddit has value as player feedback and sentiment, but this gives us a sense as well of what's actually happening in the real world and what's affecting the silent majority of our player base. So getting there uh, is great, there, but there are a number of challenges along the way. The first is simply, what are these archetypes, right? All we know is the cards in any player's deck, and we don't necessarily have any easy way to just step back and say, okay, given all the players in the world, there's millions of them, what are they doing right now? It's very difficult to get that snapshot. So first and foremost, what are they? then even if we know what they are, what's in them, right? What are the archetypes? Because there's going to be some variation. People won't all play exactly the same decks. They have 30 cards to pick. So how do we get a sense of the, the, the actual consistent content of these? How do we get a sense of some of the variants? So when people take the same archetype and say, you know, I can tweak it and make it a little better, how do we get a sense of that space? And then lastly, what about when people want to go do wild experimental things? Where does that happen? Do we just lose track of all of it? Do we only notice those crazy experiments? How do we approach this? So at this point, I'm going to switch a little bit more to the technical side and discuss some of how we actually work with this data uh, from a data scientist perspective. So in any deck in the game uh, is going to be some list of these 30 cards. Uh, from an actual like data analysis perspective, given that the game has roughly about 400 cards uh, active in the main uh, game mode at any time, that means that when we want to actually tell a machine what does this look like, we have to explode it out. And so we get about this 400 column table that says how many of each of these cards do you have for all the 400 possible cards you could put in the deck. And then each of the, you know, the sum of all the values of those columns for any given deck will be 30 because that's the number of cards you have in the game. So 400 is a, a very big number and it actually is part of the core challenge of this problem of finding the archetypes is players have the ability to put zero, one or two cards up to any of these 400 different options. And so the way we're going to do this is instead of manually trying to define some rules or ways to do it, we're going to ask a machine to cluster the data. So this is just a high level example of what clustering is doing on the back end in terms of machine learning, which is in this uh, case, there's two dimensions instead of 400, which makes it a lot easier to make a chart. Uh, we have a whole bunch of just random data. This is what it would just look like naively without anyone doing it. And this is basically what the meta looks like to us. Once you have the machine do its job, ideally it will start to identify the major groups of shared commonalities and give some sense of that, admitting that there will be some corner cases and things that may not be totally clear where they fall. And what this lets us do in this case is go from, there's a whole bunch of decks out there to, well, here's roughly three archetypes that you can start to think about. 
And a lot of the work on the data science side tends to be what's the right way to do this? How do we actually know it's good? And figuring out what good means. So this is a sort of obligatory math slide. Uh, this is introducing the name of the particular clustering algorithm we use. The big concept here that's worth just taking away is one that if you think of this red curve as what we're seeing in reality, this is a one-dimensional example, what we're trying to do is find the sort of blue curves that you could subdivide it into. So it's the algorithm's responsibility to go through and figure out what is the best way statistically to subdivide the decks we're seeing into a few core groups and identify how many of those groups should there be. Uh, it turns out doing both of those things at once is fairly difficult uh, in terms of a statistical perspective, but it is a doable thing. Um, if you extend it to two dimensions, just to give you a sense of what's going on, you'd get more of that sort of thing, of the point clouds that you're trying to identify the big groups. Uh, Gaussian is the name of a basically a bell curve, and so conceptually it's a sort of circular, spherical kind of thing in space. So it gives us a rough sense of how we think decks are grouped together. What this is and ultimately doing is trying to take something like this, which is a, a truncated version of those 400 columns showing a few decks. And what the machine sees is each of these rows is a different deck that we're feeding in. And these are from the actual players of the game at a given point in time. And we you know, vary this over time slices uh, over <coughs> time. And what it's trying to do is identify these subgroups and say, you know, all of these look like each other. So these all share very, you know, they're all using two of the silverware golem. Many of them are using two, sometimes one of the dark chair council and et cetera. So what it's done here is gone from this sort of scattered pattern to trying to group together the ones that look like one another. And this is a way that we're going to identify the major groups in the game. So with that in mind, now that we have the meta, what do we do with it? What do we actually look at? So one big aspect of this is looking at individual classes. So I mentioned there are these nine classes in the game. Each one of them has different cards available to them, so you really want to look at the meta within a given class. So in this case, we're going to look at the druid, and uh, at this time, uh, druids were fairly popular and fairly powerful. So this is an example of one part of the kind of information we provide back to the designers. So one core chunk of this is just what do these decks ultimately look like? So in this case, each column here is a slight variant on the same core archetype. So there's two variants of this archetype, uh, I probably eight-ish of this archetype and one of this. So each column is the actual list of the cards in that archetype. They don't always add up to 30 because we prune out any cards that we realize are so variable among players using that archetype that there's not actually that much consistency. So in some cases, these will only come up to like 27 or 28 cards. Usually if we can't find consistency above like 25 cards, we get worried that it's not really an archetype and it's more of something players are still experimenting and feeling out. But this is the thing designers can go look at and say, okay, here are the archetypes. How many of them are there and how variable are they? And ultimately what's in them, uh, which is very helpful later when they get to balancing decisions. The other is, how are they doing? So this breaks up the, all the games we see for the Druid in this case into the different archetypes and says, how many people are using each of these archetypes in terms of the number of matches they play? Uh, this is showing you the win rate. So I've scrubbed the values for obvious reasons, but the key idea here is this gives us a sense of looking at how effective are they? Are they winning too much, too little, to, or is it very close to the 50-50 goal? And then the last part down here is this matrix that's showing the matchups. So uh, in the interactive version of this, you're able to select the uh, class or the archetype of the other opponent, opposing player. And this matchup matrix will then show for you versus that opponent, how are your odds? Where if it's gray or whitish, that means it's about 50-50. And the more red it is, the more unfavored you are. The more green it is, the more favored you are. Uh, none of our designers are colorblind, so it's uh, not friendly in that sense. Another major slice of the class balance is then this other supplementary report. So this one is actually looking at the per player level. So they're actually digging into who are the best players in the world and what do they do in these different archetypes in these decks. So the left part is the actual sort of look at who are these top players uh, at this point in time and what do they have in terms of win rates and how many games they're playing. And so this lets them manually go in and see what's the records of people who are succeeding with these decks. What exactly are they doing and is it working out as we expect? So they can go in and then say, how do they do? And these, again, it's not 
how exactly they do it is in like we can go watch a replay of them and like snoop on them. It's a little creepy. Uh, it's much more the high level of what are in their decks, how are they doing in terms of uh, success rates and number of games they're playing. So you may see someone who pops up and has a very high win rate, but actually they've only played a few games with that deck. So maybe they just got lucky. Uh, as well as the actual composition of how they've made the deck. So the game has many expansions over time. We cycle these in and out of the main uh, game mode as new ones come out. This gives a sense of how much are they using cards in different areas, which is another useful piece of information to say, have we released new content that's either so overly popular it's just not worth using the old content, which is horrible for the player, or it's not worth investing in, which is both bad for the player because it means we put out content that has no value to them, and it's bad for us because it means players aren't actually trying out anything new. We can't learn what's actually fun about it or not. Uh, and then again, similar to that prior matrix, except in this case, it's down to the level of this individual player's record. So we get a sense of what are they playing against, how are they doing. Uh, this is, again, very useful because in Hearthstone, the competitive mode actually has a whole ranked ladder. So you can look at players who are in the top end versus the middle, etc., to get a sense of what are they using that's popular among those cohorts. Are they changing their strategies as they move, they climb the ladder or not, that sort of thing. The other aspect here is the competitiveness of the meta. So this is now when we zoom out and look at all the different classes against each other, what's going on. Uh, so this version is uh, fairly similar to the other one. In this case, we have one part that looks at how well the decks stack up. I've blurred out the numbers, but uh, apologies for that. But this is giving a sense of how strong are different decks in that meta. And the ranking gives here both how many, what's your win rate like, what are the number of games you're playing. It also gives a couple other metrics that are useful to the designers like the win rate when you play first versus second. So similar to how chess or go have notions of like first player turn advantage, they do care quite a bit about this. And particularly in Hearthstone as a live game where we continually change the cards, there could be cases where we accidentally make it too easy to win is the first turn or second turn player. So they try and keep an eye on that information as well. This part then shows how well that, that particular meta where, that you selected from the group on the left in the interactive version is doing against all the other different uh, decks in the meta. So this is similar to what I was showing earlier about the calculated win rates. And then this last section was the um, deck's uh, composition again, just so that when you are looking at a given deck, you have a sense of what you are actually looking at. So this last one uh, is uh, very colorful. Um, what this is actually showing is the timeline of everything we've ever done. So we look at the meta report and have the machine identify it uh, every week and update the results. And this keeps track of the historical popularities of the different uh, meta classes. So on the one hand, we have the actual, um, oops. OK, uh, this thing is highlighting in the other order intended. So this shows, within a given class, how popular were different meta strategies. What's interesting about this is you can see the emergence and disappearance of different strategies over time, um, sometimes disappearing for whole expansions, for example, and then reemerging later as those strategies become popular. Uh, and the reemergence uh, is because the preponderance of the cards in that kind of class are the same in function, even if not the same cards. So we may release new cards, but the kind of play style they encourage reemerges that is the same play style as before. So this is a case where this kind of machine analysis is very useful because as a human, you may call them two different decks altogether in the meta, but in fact, they're doing the same thing functionally. So I mentioned that aggro druid before. There may be an aggressive play style for druids that becomes unpopular due to a shift in the strategic space for a while and then reemerges later as we put in new cards that favor that or not. That's the kind of thing the designers can look at and go, hey, this strategy we thought was fun has completely disappeared right now. Maybe there's a way we can encourage it to reemerge through our choices and how we design the next upcoming cards. The other part here is then just the same piece of information, but scaled to the overall level of all decks. Uh, the reason for this being useful is for the designers to understand how popular are these strategies, not just in terms of when you are playing a given class, which is a zoom in on how, what, how diverse and strategically rich is it to play a given class if a player chooses a class, but also at the broader scale, how much diversity are players going to see in their opponents across the entire population. So it could easily be that a given deck is very popular within a class, but that class is unpopular, and so it's very unlikely to see much play at the broader global scale. And then, of course, last thing, as you might expect, what do the win rates look like? Uh, it turns out that 
can be very important for all these things. Uh, win rate is usually a good leading indicator of where the meta will go because if something wins a lot, uh, people will eventually start seeing it more and it sort of self-perpetuates. So it's good to be able to track those both over time and then as expansions come out. So you can see the rise and fall of different archetypes, perhaps um, you know, increasing popularity, increasing win rates for a while, counters are discovered, um, perhaps some card balance changes are made to bring it back in line. That's the sort of information that the designers can use to step back and really get a sense of what is the player experience going to be like in terms of fairness over time. So uh, that is all I had to cover. Um, this has been a big project that spanned, uh, as you could tell from the timeline, quite a few years. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that you know I certainly didn't do all the work on this, and there's many people I'm not showing. But uh, Yuan was the one to initially conceive of the project and work with the designers to scope out what it would look like and do it manually. Uh, Tien's been shepherding this project for many years. Uh, Shuo and Jens both built a huge amount of infrastructure to make this very robust, uh, reliable system that doesn't really require very much human intervention at all anymore. Uh, and with that, I am done. Thank you. Uh, questions? Um, to clarify, when you were um, determining the archetypes, those were based on the cards that were being, the similarity of cards being used? Uh, you showed the slide with the two of this, one of this, two of this card, and that determined that it was a archetype? Yes, so what it's doing... Can you repeat the question? Yes, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so the question was, uh, when we're seeing archetypes, how are we determining that uh, two decks would be in the same archetype? And the way it's doing it is uh, a little nuanced um, in the sense that it's not trying to understand how similar cards are, but how similar they are in terms of what choices players make. So the distinction there being it doesn't understand what that card is other than the fact that players choose to use it some number of times in their decks. Instead, what it's trying to suss out is how popular is the same pattern among players. So if you and I both use the same deck and change one card, we would look like we're doing something very similar. And if enough people do this consistently enough, it starts to pick up that this is probably a group to break out. Um, and there's usually uh, some degree of these sort of outliers. So you'll have various decks where it's like, you and I use the same 29 cards, someone else will use just a completely different set of 30 cards, but literally that's the only person in the world doing that. That could be an archetype, but given there's only one person there, more likely it's just they're experimenting. So when you do the long-term meta analysis, since those decks cycle in and out of, of, of playability, how do you determine that this archetype is the same archetype that you saw a year ago and then reemerged? Great question. So the question was, how do we know uh, if an archetype has disappeared and reemerged, especially if it's using different cards, that it is in fact the same archetype? Uh, that is the one part that's not automated entirely. So we do every week review the report and assign groups to it. Uh, what this lets us do is, again, back to the intuition part, uh, our data analysts do understand the game very well. Uh, most of them play at the very highest ranks in the game. And so they understand what those archetypes are, and it's very easy for them to look at the set of cards in it and give it that high-level name. Uh, the, we have actually mostly automated that process, so it turns out the machine can be pretty good about saying, does the content of this look like the content I've seen in the past? But that's really only good for the recent past, not the long-term history. So for the long-term history, it's, it can sometimes do it because there'll be enough bridging little bits that it can go, well, this looks like that, and it was just a sort of minor change. It's a ship of uh, this, oh God, I, I don't speak Greek, but uh, the idea of the ship where you keep changing out a few parts bit by bit. So you remove the planks and you put in new planks, you replace the mast, you put in a new mast. And gradually through that process, I'm sorry? Overhaul. Yes, exactly. So you've overhauled the whole thing, but not all at once. And so you can recognize that consistency over time. So yeah, that was a great question. And uh, yeah, we've, it's been a very uh, challenging problem to be able to have the machine fully understand the semantics of what these decks mean. We've only ever partially automated that process. Other questions? I'm asking one, maybe it's a silly one. You talked about the deck formation pets, and you briefly mentioned also the first turn. But all these analysis seem to be ignoring 
um, I mean, uh, active game. Do you have another method to assess that one, or you don't care about how the game is played at that point? Yeah, so the question was, uh, you know, we've talked quite a bit about elements of how the deck works, and but not much about gameplay, other than the fact that a deck may win often or have an advantage in the first turn. Uh, because we're focusing on strategy, uh, we don't want to look at gameplay because that's independent of strategy. In the sense that once you're in the match, the gameplay starts, but the deck stops. There's nothing else happening to the deck. So for the designers, that piloting element is often more an element of player skill and independent of the deck. So for these analyses, because the focus is on the decks and the cards, that's the main reason we've chosen not to look too much into gameplay. We certainly do look into gameplay for other analyses, but toward the point of designing new cards, because most of the cards in terms of gameplay are often driven more by what do the designers think will make the game interesting and fun and fresh, they don't want to actually dig into the exact strategies players are using at a tactical level. Uh, the strategic level, they can control the cards. They can't control, once the game has started, what choices the player makes. This is explicitly towards what's the thing that they can control, which is what cards are available to the players to compose decks to begin with. Is the assumption here that you know, play through, the gameplay will even out, then you can look at decks in your own absolute value? So. Uh, so the assumption here is that um, the key values that the designers care about uh, are the ones we're best trying to reflect. So things like the win rate, the popularity, and the first turn advantage. Uh, when you start talking about gameplay, it's often, one, there's a high degree of randomness in Hearthstone as a game. And two, uh, the player choices where that starts to affect in terms of gameplay uh, tend to be ultimately reflected in how often you're winning. Um, Certainly, the, you know, the diversity of choices is reflected in the moment-to-moment -moment play, but that's not something that's directly controllable through the cards, other than the options they afford the players. So once you get a snapshot of all the information, who makes the decision about what needs to happen, and, and what's the designer's response or kind of creative stuff? That's a great question. So the question was, given this information, who makes the decision about it and how does that work? Uh, the answer is the designers are the primary consumers. So this information is available to them at any time. And they're actually the ones who make any decisions uh, in terms of what to do. So we often, like, if it's really uh, obvious that something might be going weird that they're not already aware of for some reason or they aren't considering, we try and make them aware of it. But it's ultimately up to them uh, to use this. They primarily do not use this very heavily in the uh, most forward-looking creative side. So when they're designing cards in terms of brand new card sets, they'll typically rely more on sort of the players and the intuition side as to what was fun in the past set and what was not. They'll use the data to know, was it being used a lot or not? Was it effective or not? So they can use that to help inform how they make those decisions. Where this data tends to be much more of a driver is when it comes to the balance changes. So we regularly rebalance the cards in the game independent of those new card sets coming out. And so that's where these things will come into a lot more value because they're actually able to say, okay, all the decks are always using this one card. We didn't want that card to be mandatory to play the game. We're going to alter the balance of that particular card to make it less mandatory, whether that means making it more expensive for players to use in the game or weaker in the game, that kind of thing. So a lot of the decisions around that do happen through this kind of information. Uh, it will be, oh, we, you know, we wanted them to use this card. Nobody's using the card. Maybe we need to make it more powerful. And both through the mechanism of explicitly signaling to players as a community, hey, we're making the card more powerful, that alone can often drive people to want to use it now because they're like, wait, if the designers think it's more powerful now or want it to be more powerful, maybe I should consider it. As well as then the actual effect in the game of the card is more powerful. So now it's not purely perception of the power of the card, but also the actual reality of its functionality in the game. So a lot of the decision making uh, in the long term sort of maintenance and grooming of the game comes from this, but not so much the, oh, you ought to make a card like this because, you know, these cards are currently effective or anything like that. You leave room for intuition and that's the creative part. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And again, these are, um, yeah, so we leave room for intuition. Sorry, just pairing questions here. Um, yeah, we leave a lot of room for intuition. Uh, players and data. Uh, the reason those are there is it's also very different groups of people, right? So we are data scientists or uh, in Global Insights, data analysts, et cetera. 
we have a lot of the information. The designers, of course, are the ones who have the intuition about what they want to be doing with the game. And then we also have player sentiment and feedback, both through forums and surveys and other instruments. So it's very much this sort of how do you bring these together and the people who collect these bit, uh, different perspectives together into a conversation than it is, well, the numbers say this, so go do that. Or, well, my gut says this is fun, so it must be fun to everybody. Or, you know, someone on Reddit is unhappy, so we better change the game. Uh, it's very much more of let's all talk together and figure out what's the right way to go forward. But uh, especially at Blizzard, you know, design tends to rule. So ultimately, if we say, you know, we're worried about this from the day and they're like, you know, we want to go this way with the design, is ultimately their call. You know, if I could play better, I, uh, yeah, I only ever used it, uh, if you've played Hearthstone, the only other time I was ever effective was at uh, an extremely cheap and uh, cheap in the, the cost in the game sense deck. And uh, it was one that required almost no gameplay skill to pilot, uh, as we could tell from the win rates. And that was a deck that didn't last very long. Um, yeah, other, we have internally uh, goofed around with trying to use the decks from the meta. I think the best case of talking about the value of data was actually a scenario where um, back when I was running a lot of the report myself, we found a very unpopular uh, deck was very, very effective. Uh, it was called the Dragon Warrior deck. And at um, the time, I had taken it to the best players in the department because I'm terrible at the game and gone like, guys, I think this is going to be like a big thing. Nobody's using it yet, but the guys who are using it are winning a lot and they're playing enough games that we don't think it's noise. And uh, they all played it and uh, about you know, over the next several days. They all came back to me and told me it was utter trash. I had no idea what I was talking about. Um, and I said, okay, whatever. Uh, and we left the report alone. And then uh, that was a deck where it took a, a month or six weeks or so before anyone else really caught on. And then that became this deck archetype that uh, for quite a while was dominant in the meta uh, thereafter. And it was a case of a really beautiful illustration of where that it can be useful where not many people in the player community were discussing this, the designers didn't necessarily have the intuition that this type of deck was even possible, let alone effective, and yet it turned out to snowball in popularity. Um, and we also often see the opposite. The designers, uh, before a new card set launches, uh, set up their own set of decks that they, are believe, they believe will be like the powerful decks or the fun decks to play. And uh, they'll internally, of course, have figured this out while they were developing this, uh, and then it's very interesting to see how many of those actually pan out and how many don't in terms of the creativity of our player community. And that's really the heart of why we need any of this at all, is uh, if our designers had perfect intuition, we wouldn't need to look at what people do. But Hearthstone is a very community-driven game, and it turns out uh, people are very, very creative, uh, which is you know fantastic when it works out well. No more questions? Well, thank you very much, Andy. Yep, time to hand over the mic. So they warned me the uh, clip, I guess, isn't working very well on this guy, uh, or on this part. Uh, yeah, you can just put that in your pocket. Um, for this, the key is this part needs to be in here. So you want to clip it so it's somewhere around, like, maybe on one of your, like, lapels or something. is just near your mouth and numb. Uh, I would just quick talk a bit and just see if they can validate that it's working, but that should be fine from my understanding. That is not mine. Can you say something? Um, can we check is, the mic? Is Please. the sound working? Is the sound working? Okay, awesome. thank you. Um, before, okay, wait, thank you, Alex, for your beautiful talk. Very intense and data driven, very interesting. Um, the second speaker for today is Nele, who uh, comes from Belgium, and she's taking a particular philosophical angle, which is called philosophy of fiction, to look at video games. And this is quite interesting, in my opinion, that similar to the previous one, might be kind of difficult to grasp at a certain point. Um, hopefully you will find it interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk a bit about player motivation in video games, or as some philosophers would call it, fictional desires in fictional worlds. I want to start off with an, uh, an example of a situation I was in when playing a video game, namely uh, Uncharted Drake's Fortune. 
I was in this very dark hallway and I am easily scared by horror aspects in games. So as I was already scared when just seeing how dark it was. But I knew I had to go through this because I wanted to save my friend, Elena. She was caught by mercenaries. So I started to walk through the hallway and I was jumped by zombies from all sides. And um, as I said, I'm easily scared. So I tried to run away. I wanted to get away from these creatures as fast as possible, but they were faster than me. So I was killed pretty easily. And then I respawned and I was back in this dark hallway. But this time I wanted to kill all the creatures. So I think this is a, quite a common situation for a video game player, but from a philosophical perspective, a lot of weird things are going on. For example, I said, I want to save Elena. But of course, I know Elena is not real. I know she's not alive, so how do I even want to save her? I know she's just a fictional character. In the same way, I said, I want to kill all the zombies, but I'm not stupid, I know zombies aren't real, so how could I want to kill them? And then lastly, I said, I want to run away from the creatures, but of course, I didn't run away from my screen. I just meant I want to run away from them in the game. So I actually just moved my control stick instead of running away and fleeing my house. So within the philosophy of fiction, this is all connected to the puzzle of imaginative desires. Uh, we can feel desires towards fictional characters. We can be motivated to perform fictional actions by these desires. And that's weird because real desires require real actions and real desires requires, require real objects of these desires. So philosophers have this whole debate going on of whether our desires towards fiction are real desires or I desires, which are imaginative desires. I desires are imaginative analogs of desires. When we I desire something, we don't desire something about the fiction, but we fictionally desire it. That is, our desires towards the fiction are uh, actually embedded within the fictional world themselves. So I want to talk about this philosophical debate on I desires a bit more. Um, philosophers have two reasons to talk about imaginative desires, and that is the content of our desires towards fiction, namely non-existent fictional characters, and the fact that these desires don't motivate real actions, but only fictional actions. I will try to argue that the philosophical debate on I desires is misguided because philosophers never talk about video games when talking about these kinds of desires. They only talk about theater, film, literature, and children's games of make-believe, which I think is a missed opportunity. And lastly, I want to argue that uh, imaginative desires have practical use when talking about video games. They uh, can tell us something about the immersion in fictional worlds by players uh, versus the way players engage with gameplay. And they can also maybe explain why players sometimes want things they don't really want in real life and why they form immoral game desires. So to start off, the content of desires towards fiction um, is problematical from a philosophical perspective. Philosophers often talk about um, a reader of Charlotte's Web who says, I want Charlotte to survive. Of course, Charlotte doesn't really exist and the readers know this. So maybe some philosophers say this desire isn't a real desire, but merely an, Im an imaginative one. Because just like the reader doesn't really think that Charlotte really exists, but only imagines her to exist, maybe the reader also doesn't really desire Charlotte to survive, but only imaginatively desires her to. Opponents of I desires, which are many philosophers, don't like this at all. They say when a reader says they want Charlotte to survive, this merely expresses the real desire that the character Charlotte survives in the fiction. Opponents of I desire, sorry, defenders of I desires have an answer to this. They say, no, maybe the reader doesn't want this about the fiction at all. It could very well be that this person really wants the book to end bad. They like tragedies, so they want a bad ending. But while reading the book, they also want Charlotte to survive. So according to them, there is no way to explain the situation except if we accept I desires. 
because then we can describe the desire for a bad ending as a real desire, which someone feels towards the fiction from outside of the story, and the desire that Charlotte survives as an I desire they only have because they are immersed in the story. Opponents of I desires think this is bullshit. Why can't they both be real desires? Of course, we can have a situation in which someone likes tragedy, but also wants the main character to survive, but we often have conflicting desires. You may want to prepare for a presentation, but also get some sleep because you are incredibly jet lagged. But that's not a problem at all. We often have conflicting desires like these. So opponents of I desire say we don't need uh, imaginative desires to explain this at all. Okay, so this is an entire debate that only talks about literature. So what about video games? If we compare the reader wanting Charlotte to survive and the gamer wanting Elena to survive, we see that there are a lot of differences, which might be interesting for the debate on I desires. The reader who says they want Charlotte to survive, they really feel this desire themselves. When they say, I want Charlotte to survive, they mean I, myself, want Charlotte to survive. Also, when reading a book, there is a certain distance between you and the fictional world you read about. Martha Nussbaum, a philosopher, says that when we are reading, the story is not ours. We are not part of the story. We cannot change anything about the story. We can only read about it. So the desire of Charlotte surviving can easily be explained as a real desire, something we just feel towards the story from outside of the narrative. But the desire of Elena surviving is different. When we say, I want Elena to survive, we don't really mean I as in the player, but I as in the player character, because I am identifying with Nathan Drake at that point. So the player kind of role plays. He takes on a role within the fictional world, and it is within this fictional world that the desire to save Elena comes to be. So Robson and Meskin, two philosophers, talk about video games as self-involving interactive fictions, because we are self-involved, the story is ours, and the desires we feel towards the fictional characters are themselves part of the fictional world. So the reason why it is uh, more useful to talk about I desires in a video game case is because we are immersed in video games in a different way than we are in uh, literature, theater, or film. The second reason why philosophers talk about I desires are fictional actions. Remember, I said I want to run away from the zombies. But that, at that point, of course, I didn't really run away. I merely fictionally ran away within the video game. And this fictional action, some philosophers would say, can only be motivated by a fictional desire. Because if I had a real desire to run away, I would have really run away. So defenders of I desires say real actions are motivated by real desires, while fictional actions are motivated by I desires or imaginative desires. Again, opponents of I desires don't like this at all. They say, okay, real actions are motivated by real desires, but fictional actions can also be motivated by real desires, namely, real desires to fictionally act or to pretend to act. The example given by Amy Kind, one of the opponents of I desires, is a child pretending to be a dog. This child forms the desire to say woof woof because it wants to pretend to be a dog. There is no I desire necessary here because the child just wants to pretend and thus it pretends. A real desire can easily explain the child's actions. Defenders of I desires don't like this solution. They say that someone being motivated by a desire to pretend would always remain securely outside of the fiction. That is, for example, when we are playing a video game, then we don't want to pretend to shoot zombies. We just want to shoot the zombies from within the game. We don't go outside of the game to decide on what we want to do and then go back into the game to act out this desire. So what... The, Defenders of I desires are saying is that the immersion in our games are actually a reason to accept I desires because the uh, actions we perform in games are also motivated by desires we only have in this game. 
Again, opponents of eye desires aren't convinced at all, and they say, so what? Maybe this is just how we play games. Maybe we decide on what to do from outside of the game, and we act out our real desires in the game. Again, it is clear that uh, philosophers don't really talk about video games when arguing for their point. They focus on children's pretend games. And indeed, when a child barks in pretend play, it does so because it wants to pretend to be a dog. So a real desire can easily explain this. Children often go outside of their make-believe games to decide on what to do within their make-believe games. For example, when children are playing cops and robbers, they can say outside of their game, now I'll be the cop who catches the thief. And then they go back inside their game and act this out. But video game players don't work like that. When a player shoots zombies, it doesn't seem so obvious that she is guided by a desire to pretend to shoot. Because this would require her to step out of her character every time she decides on what she wants to do, after which she would perform the preferred action within the game. So, this debate on eye desires by philosophers is kind of a mess. Um, the conclusion is that eye desires might be necessary for true immersion. We don't really know. Philosophers don't really argue their point very well because they never refer to video games. Philosophers don't even agree on eye desires existing. They don't even agree on what eye desires would be if they did exist. And eye desires are actually a serious complication of human psychology. So why am I telling you about this? It is because I think eye desires might have a special usefulness when talking about video games. I think that even when we don't accept eye desires really existing, we can use them as a construct to talk about various aspects of the video game experience, such as the players engaging with either the gameplay or the narrative of the video game, or the way gamers can form immoral desires. So the interesting thing about video games from a philosophical perspective is that they are not only fictions, they not only contain a fictional world, fictional characters and a narrative, but they are also games. That is, they have rules and you can really win or lose them. The desires felt by video game players uh, reflect this. Gamers can have both real and eye desires at the same time when playing a video game. For example, when I said I want to shoot all the zombies and save Elena, this is a clear narrative internal desire. It is fueled by my being immersed in the game. It is attributed not to me, but to the player character. It's a standard imaginative desire. But I could also want to shoot all the zombies to finish the level, which is a clear real desire because the object winning the game is real. This desire is narrative external. It doesn't have anything to do with the story. I just want to win the game. It is fueled by the gameplay of the game, and it is attributed to me, the player. Nathan Drake has nothing to do with finishing the level. Nathan Drake would never say, I want to finish this level. No, he wants to save Elena. So instead of talking about real desires and eye desires, we could also talk about gameplay desires and immersion-fueled desires. The interesting thing about this is that there is a kind of continuum on which we can place games. Games can evoke real desires in their players when they make the player want a high score, they make the player want to finish levels, or they have lots of achievements that players might want to hunt. Uh, an example of a game like this is Tetris. There's not even a fictional world in Tetris. There are only real desires connected to playing Tetris. You want a high score, you want to get as many blocks as possible in a line, stuff like that. Other games, however, are very narratively, um, have a very much of a narrative perspective, and they evoke narrative desires. And these are felt from within the fictional world by the player. For example, wanting to save a character, wanting to save your teammates in Mass Effect, wanting revenge on a boss that killed you three times already. An example of a very much narrative game is Life is Strange. Life is Strange uh, has choices like, do you want a bacon omelette or a Belgian waffle? There is no reason at all from a gameplay perspective to choose either the one or the other. So the only thing you have here is 
you being immersed in the story and just, well, what do you like best in this case? So it's very much immersion fueled. Of course, I'm not trying to say that any of these is better than the other. I don't, I'm not saying that games should evoke narrative desires or should evoke real desires. Both actually have their usefulness. Narrative desires, as I have tried to show, um, make sure the player is more immersed in the game. It also makes moral choices possible, because if players are not merely interested in winning or losing the game, you can actually interest them to save a character or let a character die to save another character or stuff like that. It's only possible when gamers are actually immersed within the fictional world. Real desires can then make sure a game is replayable. Think about uh, trophy hunters replaying a game two or three times to get all the trophies. That's a real desire, the trophies are real. Uh, also, real desires make sure gamers have goals <coughs> when playing a game. Um, in a game like Life is Strange, you can get lost because there's not a clear goal, but in Tetris, well, it's clear what you have to do, and gamers sometimes like that. Of course, the most interesting thing is that a lot of games combine real desires and imaginative desires. And what is interesting about this is that games can either make the real desires and the imaginative desires clash, or they can align them. An example uh, that is used a lot in philosophy of clashing desires in video games is saving or harvesting the little sisters in Bioshock. From a gameplay perspective, it would be a smart idea to harvest them. They give you a lot of power early in the game, and you could play easier if you have that power. The philosopher Grant Taverner describes his meeting uh, the Little Sisters. He actually wanted to harvest them to gain the power because he wasn't very good at the game. But then he saw them and he said, those big eyes, pigtail and the pretty flock, I couldn't do it. Instead, I decided to save her. And as I did so, an emotion of sympathy and brotherly care swept over me. So it's clear that Grant Taverner here chose um, the narrative desire of, cha of saving the little girl over the gameplay desire or of harvesting her and using the power. A lot of games, on the other hand, align real desires and gameplay desires. And this is maybe a silly example, but a lot of games do something similar. In Prince of Persia, you could save your game by drinking at a fountain. In that way, when a gamer had the desire to save uh, her game, she could also say, I want to drink at a fountain. That means that immersion was never broken, even when the gamer acted on a real desire, because you could explain it as the desire of the avatar to drink. Lastly, I think there is some worth in uh, imaginative desires and their application to video games in the, um, the sense that they could explain the immoral desires formed uh, when playing video games. I desires are often uh, talked about as wanting things you don't really want. That is, when a gamer says, I want to shoot everything in sight, you could see this as a real desire to shoot people in the game. But that would mean that the player really wants to imagine to shoot people, or they really want to pretend to be uh, violent. And these, this desire would be the player's own desire. If you, however, um, accept I desires, you could say that the player just imaginatively takes on the role of a non-existent player character, forms desires on the basis of the context of this character, and the immoral in-game desires you might have are actually the characters. And if the gamer stops playing the game, did the desires also stop being there? The desires a player feels when playing the game only have moral significance within the fictional world, because they are part of the fictional world. So to conclude, I think I desires are very useful to talk about the video game experience. The philosophical debate on I desires got stuck because it's quite impossible to prove either the existence or the usefulness of I desires without talking about interactive fictions such as video games. I'm not arguing that we need to accept the uh, existence of I desires as a new uh, mental state, but I am trying to argue that the concept of I desires is useful when talking about the way players engage with video games as a combination of fiction and gameplay, and 
uh, to explain immoral desires player, players might have when playing video games. Thank you. I have a question for you. Um, all of your examples, and almost all the time until the end, you talked about video games. At a certain point, you talked about interactive pictures. Mm -hmm. And my question was, to which extent is are your ideas of the usefulness of this um, concept typical of video games rather than, say, digital world experiences, training simulation, flight simulators, yeah. and so on? So yeah. Can you elaborate on that? So the question was whether uh, my ideas on eye desires are typical for video games or interactive fiction more in general. Um, and I think it's definitely the, the latter one. I think it's... Um, applicable to all interactive fiction in which you in some way role play. Because if you take on the, um, the role of a character within a fictional world, if you identify with this character, eye desires will become important to explain your actions within this fictional world. So definitely, I talked about video games because that's my research, but it would be applicable to interactive fiction in general. So for example, if somebody criticized you for only talking about video games only through your camera, just an example. It's just an example, yeah. It's easier to talk about video games because I know them myself, but it would definitely be applicable to a lot of board games, I think. Um, yeah, stuff like Dungeons and Dragons would also be uh, possible. Since nobody seems to have a question, I have another one. I hope you don't mind that I'm holding on the You talked about the fact that Players in general do not step away from the fictional world in which they're in to make game design decisions. Decisions, sorry. But for example, if you read, and I'm sure you did, uh, literature concerning um, transgressive game, critical game, and so on and so forth, those theories presuppose that the player actually can take that position, and there are some advantages, and of course, these advantages in taking that position. Does your theory account for those cases? Yeah, so there are cases in which players can actually step away from the fictional world to decide what they will do within the fictional world. Um, because players don't have to play video games as fiction. Uh, within the philosophy, we say fictions are uh, works of, uh, well, representational works which mandate certain imaginings. But players can also choose not to imagine anything at all and just play the game as a real game. If they are only interested in winning the game, for example, then they can just play the game completely from outside of the fictional world. Doesn't that though contradict your need for I mean, at least in a group of players, your need for I desires to explain the behavior? Uh, yeah, certainly. But I also think um, the fact that players can step away from fictional worlds and form desires outside of the fictional world also shows us that some players don't play like this at all. Uh, some players never leave the fictional world, and we can see that in cases where players make decisions that um, aren't good from a gameplay perspective at all. They go against the meta of the game and make decisions just because they want to save a certain character because they are immersed. Okay, so which aspects would be important to bring out the imaginative, des yeah. imaginative desires in uh, players? I think all of the ones you uh, summed up are important. And I think they really have to work together to make a coherent fictional world. I think that, um, for example, things like expressions of characters can be so important. Um, sometimes the, the realness uh, of the situations, uh, how much of a fictional world there is to explore, the story, um, yeah, all of them have to work together, I think, if you really want players to engage in that imaginative desire way. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious as to what brought your focus to I desires. Um, so my focus on I desires started when reading about the philosophical debate on I desires and seeing that philosophers completely ignored video games in the debate. 
So they talked a lot about, like I said, literature, theater, film, children's games of make-believe. But then all their arguments seem to fit the video game experience better than what they were actually using as examples. So, um, yeah, I argued for this on many other philosophical conferences. And the reaction I'll, I always get is that philosophers just kind of forgot about video games. Yeah, yeah. So the question is whether I desires in video games can actually make people have these desires in real life. So what I think uh, the problem is there is that this guy didn't have imaginative desires, but for some reason formed real desires on the basis of the game. That is, he didn't interact with the game as a mere fiction. I think that's where it went wrong. So, I mean, eye desires don't lead to immoral behavior in real life because eye desires stop where the fictional world stops. So, the only explanation would be that this guy interacted with a game in a way that is not interacting with fiction. Thank you very much. Sir. So then we can take a little more time. Okay. Sure. Awesome. Because I was so fast. Uh, yeah. Just give me five. Give me a five signal when you're to our top and five. Okay. I have a very good night. Thank you. Uh, third speaker, which you see next to me, um, Gordon is a colleague of mine at the Institute of Digital Games, which is an institute which studies video games only from a number of perspectives. And it's on a small island in the Mediterranean. I think he's going to be uh, mentioning that. What I figured out a few years ago is that Gordon has a second life. He is also a DJ. Oh, that one. Uh -huh. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thought you were going to talk about the other thing. <laughs> Good. No chicken suit but thing. He also okay. Has a third life. No, don't go into that. No, that's not the one. Ah, okay. He also does produces, designs, and funds board games. Wait, wait. This is all weird. Well, if you have time, I can blabber. Blab, blab. Okay. So what he does, and he's been doing this for the third time around uh, with his latest game, he produces board games professionally, distributes them all over the world, and soon one of them is coming to the US as well. Yeah. yeah. Which is, uh, you can show. This is one of them. Uh, the first one was Post-Human, second one Ventures, and third one Post-Human Saga, which is about to be released. So, he has many talents and many ways to look at video games, in particular game studies and narrative are uh, his focus. So today he's going to use his background in game studies and narrative to explain how he does his board game design and hybrid board game design. Some of the games he worked on, in fact, also use iPads and uh, digital media to complement gameplay. Are you ready to go? Or? Yep. Okay, good. Just in time. I had nothing else to say. <laughs> give, a, give a hand to go. Yeah. And also to our international guest, thanks for making the flights to talk here. First of all, thank you. And thank, uh, thank you to Sandy for inviting me over. It's really great to get the chance to check out the program and the lovely, lovely um, town. OK, so um, I changed the talk a little bit from uh, what I was intending to give, which was a bit more academic. I figured um, I'll make it a little bit more, more practical, more focused on design, and more personal, which is not how I usually give my talks. And this thing is changing on its own. I don't like it. One second. <laughs> oh, no, it's going to do that. Why is it changing automatically? OK. I have to go back and forth. Anyway, so um, yeah, it's going to be a little bit more personal. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I might ramble on a little bit, but hopefully it'll be at least vaguely entertaining. So I, um, 
as, as Stefan mentioned, I wear several hats. Um, I'm an associate professor at the Institute of, Institute of Digital Games at the University of Malta, where I'm mainly an academic. That's sort of my, my main job, my main life. Um, I found uh, two studios, first Mighty Box, which is a, a video game studio, and then Mighty Boards, which is a board game studio. They're separate entities with separate staff and so on. And now I'm mainly, I, I'm a game designer in both, and writer, and I'm mainly now taking care of Mighty Boards and, and sort of from, from a business and operational perspective. Um, let's start with the, uh, with the research. Um, so I look at various aspects of um, games, but they're all, um, my, my background mainly is in the humanities, in the theoretical humanities, and uh, English literature and literary theory, media, um, studies, uh, film theory, and so on. And my main areas of research are player experience. Um, I'd say that is my sort of my grounding, um, my, my, my area of focus mainly so far. It's the, um, I, I wrote a book called uh, In Game, which looks at um, immersion and presence and uh, forwards a model for uh, better understanding uh, player involvement in games. That was published by MIT Press. It's been used um, in academia, by industry, and so on. Um, I I've also written quite a bit about game narrative, which is something we're going to be talking about uh, more later on, and also about game ontology, <coughs> definitions of games, um, taxonomies, and the nature of games, and so on. Um, ah, I left that there. I really like that song, so I'll just leave it. Um, so the first game I made, um, the first video game I made, was uh, Will Laughter Us Apart, which is a game with the creation of Love Will Tear Us Apart. Um, uh, it was done by myself and a team of people that had never touched games before on a tiny budget of 20k. And uh, yeah, it did uh, fairly well. It um, was a, a free game, it was more of an art piece than anything else. Um, and uh, it, it explored the... Uh, um, the theme of the song, and, and my main, it was an academic question I wanted to ask, which it was, can we simulate, can we use simulation to explore um, metaphor or topics that are quite ephemeral um, and quite sort of uh, hard to, to, to bring to us to a simulation or to a simulation-like medium? Um, and uh, thus, um, yeah, it was initially just an experiment. I wanted to actually do an adaptation of a poem, and instead I ended up I mean, uh, was just got stuck in my head, and, and I decided to work on that. And it got a fairly good reception, it was all over uh, media, PC Gamer, um, uh, Rolling Stone, all the major sort of music and, and, uh, and game uh, venues, um, several awards, and award nominations, and so on. It did, it did well, it was fine. And then um, I started working on a video game called Post Human. Um, and a board game um, that sort of tied in with it. And the initial motivation was, I just wanted to sort of publish a board game because I had been informally um, designing tabletop systems since I was a toddler, not kidding. My dad forced me to. I had no choice in the matter. That's a different story. Um, but I had never published them, and I never even considered publishing them for some reason. And I was working on a video game that had, um, who, whose basis was a... Uh, uh, kind of tabletop system, and I told the guys, like, well, can I just, you know, I want to illustrate an, um, uh, an, a point about game narrative that I was having a hard time arguing with, uh, with the founder of Game Studies, with Espen Orsett about, and it was easier for me to do that, to do that illustration of the, uh, of the model and an argument that I was developing in, a, in board game form. And I used uh, an excuse to my studio saying, hey, we're going to go to Kickstarter with a video game, so let's just drop a board game, screw that up, but at least we'll learn Kickstarter and get some people um, at least talking about, hopefully, our world. We won't fund, um, but fine, we'll, we'll learn. Um, if we did fund, and it ended up uh, being the 11th biggest board game Kickstarter, at the time in 2015, we raised 350,000, um, and that was pretty surprising. Um, we'll talk a bit more about these games later on, um, so I'll just go and pop, um, hop through them. And then I decided to, um, I was talking to MIT Press about my second book, which was meant to be about narrative, about game narrative. And I just got really into board games. And I said, you know, 
would you be interested in a, in a book about board game design instead? And they said, absolutely. You know, we want to, to have that seminal book. And, and I said, okay, let's talk about it. We have a, a book contract. And I felt my first instinct was, I need to know all the things about board games, everything. So I made a board game on my own. Um, Postum was done with the team. And had the co-publisher helping us with some aspects. I did this on my own. I, I hired an artist and a designer, find everything else. Um, I kind of learned from scratch, everything from injection molding for miniatures um, to the whole production process, uh, shipping, logistics, um, everything. And I ran that process and, and basically started getting, getting to know the industry better because it was co-published by the, one of the biggest publishers in board games, Asmode, um, and translated into French, Spanish and German, um, and also kickstarted it. It went fine, it wasn't amazing, like $180,000 or something. Um, and we printed those 10,000 copies of it, which is a lot for a game of a $95 price point, right? And that was, it sold all over the world, basically. Um, so that was an exercise, again, now, um, it, it, it also had quite a bit to do with um, my take on game narrative, but here, uh, Posthuman is quite sort of RPG light, it's quite a journey, um, and it, it, it tracks a lot of time and changes between different time frames from like the immediate combat to you traveling in the world and so on. This is much more, much more focused in creating a, a particular kind of experience, which is sort of more contained. Basically, an adaptation of a revenge movie, old boy, to be more precise, in board game format. How do you create that kind of feeling in players and that, those kind of sort of exciting um, uh, moments from those movies? We'll talk about it a bit more later. And then um, I was just really not happy with post-human <laughs> at all. I hated it. Um, and there were, there were some comments here. Yeah, there's some negative stuff on BoardGameGeek and Reddit. Of course, um, I wasn't used to that, having done an artsy thing before and just written academic pieces and, and so on. And I'm like, no, I must fix this. I must fix this or I will not rest. We wanted to continue the uh, games in the post-human world. And I, didn't, I was trying to do some expansions for it, and I just couldn't. Because the annoyance of this thing I didn't like kept being there. And I, I was not comfortable working on, um, on a system that, that I thought could have been better. So I wanted to a new found, keep the same world, advance the story, and create uh, a more tactical, more Euro-like system that would be a better platform for expansions to come. Um, it would have a longer life in terms of uh, pushing. And I wanted to have a situation where expansions would be um, would push the story forward and introduce different gameplay. I needed a very, very strongly modular system. And because of one design choice um, that was sort of driven by my academic background or my academic goals um, in post-human, I couldn't really do that. And that was the main point of the game where you switch to mutant and switch sides um, and, and play against the human players. More on that later. Um, now, um, a couple of days' time, I guess, next week, um, we're launching Human Sanctuary, which is a video game um, on, on Steam, uh, early access, still it's early days, and it's an adaptation of the board games. And as time went by, we kept, ended up changing the original game, which was this, um, to fit uh, now the, the much bigger um, population of uh, board game players. We did kickstart this, um, and it just, it was terrible. We, didn't, we canceled the funding, it just was absolute poo. Um, which was exactly the opposite of what we expected at the time. Um, so now this has become an adaptation of kind of a, a, a mesh of the two systems and also its own thing. And it was always designed to be um, sort of dovetail story-wise with the board games. Um, and it has quite a different system. And, poof. and then I had to ask, why? It's really easy when you're going at a you know at full steam ahead and, and developing one game after the other, overlapping design, it's exciting, blah blah. Um, and it's easy to lose sight of why you do what you do. And at some point you will need to justify the 14 hour days, all the the stress that they create. Um, and you know, especially when um, the board game world is quite small, especially if you're kickstarting, you have a very direct relationship to the, the backers, to your players. They're telling you directly. You're not, you don't have a publisher and then you know, they're sent 
of the shops and shops sell them and then they'll comment online. No, they're telling you directly, they're emailing you, right? Um, so you really need to have that kind of um, strong conviction about what you're doing. But more importantly, it's good to step in and, and ponder, like, what, what's this? Is it a passion? Am I doing it for the money? What, what am I doing it for? And then um, for the book that I'm working on, I'm interviewing most major um, board game designers um, to look at their process and how they shape their imagination and what motivates them to design as well. So I've asked all these guys the same question. It was interesting to see that the answer was, was uh, very similar to my motivation to, to create and, uh, and was very common to you. Know. And, and the main answer is, well, like um, the fiction I've written, like the poetry I've written before um, and published, whatever I create seems to always go in the same direction. I have a passion, and a lot of designers, or board game designers, and I guess game designers in general, have a passion for creating worlds, scenarios, sequences, emotions, and disseminate those, not share, I'm not sure if this is the right word, but to get others to step into their minds and, and experience those worlds, right? If and this is what several designers said, and that I agree, if it was possible for me to port my, the images in my mind, the world, directly into my players, that would be the ideal thing, right? Instead, I use, I, a lot of board game designers say, like, this is the most direct way I can do that. I can influence the imagination. Some were, ah, don't change, don't change. <laughs> Some were in the video game world, there were video game designers, uh, one major designer was from Ubisoft, and um, there were theater directors, um, writers, filmmakers, and so on. And they tried different media and said, like, well, this is the, the medium that really created this connection. I think that this is uh, common to a lot of video game designers as well. So we have a drive to create worlds and to inhabit them. And thus, we connect those two. We have a, a desire to have people walk into our worlds. Because, of course, if those worlds are shared uh, with others, if they're experienced by others, they become more real. Right? And it's obviously um, when we give birth to, to a world, we want it to, to survive and disseminate and spread. So we have this situation, um, we have these different elements of, of the process. We have now creator's world, which is kind of in our minds. Um, we use different design tools and perspectives to um, communicate that to players, and they in turn influence the world. Right? And, and then these these three elements are sort of have, are in a matrix. They influence each other. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. And my point, or one of the sort of the arguments I'm making here, is that although I'm I have a big passion for design, it is clear that that is quite fueled and strongly informed by my um, theoretical understanding, my um, my critical analysis. Um, of, of games and other media. And that's been incredibly useful. <sighs> I'm going to complain about this all the time. And that's been incredibly useful in my design work. More, to me, personally, just to me, far more useful than any game design handbook I've read. No offense to, to, to anyone writing those things. Um, probably, if I didn't have this background, those, would, those texts would have been more useful. But to me, personally, I get a much richer understanding and a, a much richer toolkit using the, the theoretical knowledge I, I have from the theory, from media studies, from philosophy uh, of mind, and a tiny bit of philosophy here and there, um, psychology, sociology, anthropology, and so on. Why? Because they give me tools to work in the harder, to, to assess and, and to um, form these, to do this transfer, basically, right? I get a better understanding of this and this. How? Let me just give... A couple of very random examples. What's tricky with this when you're talking about theory, especially to industry, is that the, um, the, pay, the payoff is not direct. Okay? It's a very indirect process with indirect benefits. Okay? I'll give some examples. So let's talk about you know, other words. Those words that I'm saying are in our minds as designers and we want to, so that, to share them and, uh, and have others walk in. Um, <laughs> how, let's start with the most basic um, understanding of this. What kind of other world am I creating? What are my personal beliefs of, of other worlds? Are they fictional worlds? Are they separate from our world? What, what goal do I have 
Why am, why am I creating these worlds? Why do I have this drive? It's been with us since early Homo sapiens, right? But, but why? And, and how do I position myself vis-a-vis um, -vis these other words? Do I view the relationship, my relationship, and my player's relationship to these worlds in a Coleridge sense of a suspension of disbelief that we have a real world, a real life, and we bracket that life in order to believe that this fictional thing exists, but it's a bracketing? Or do we go um, a la Tolkien and say, like, no, it's not a matter of um, suspending our disbelief, it's a matter of actively creating belief. Um, in secondary worlds, he calls them. He, he organizes sort of our relationship with fictional worlds with, as there's a primary world, there's a secondary world, and they're separate from each other. Um, and we cultivate this belief in these other worlds. And the more belief and the more it's shared, the, the stronger that world becomes. Then Borges comes on this and goes like, you, you're both idiots. Right? That's an absolutely incorrect and uninteresting way of viewing worlds, fictional worlds that we create. He... He, instead, his, his work is fascinating because the fictional worlds that he, he creates are always, even in his stories, are, have a transformative power on the real world that's pitched within his own stories because his belief is that fictions change reality because fiction and reality is not dis distinct as certain branch of philosophy would, would say. Um, that fiction is a transformative agent, that our fictions create our reality. And we can go into, um, uh, Catherine Hales mentioned this and how it became post-human, thinking about how cyberpunk fiction created the desire for a networked world, and a sort of matrix-like world that pushed technology a lot and so on. Um, Nick Montfort has a great uh, little book uh, from MIT Press that also talks about this, how fiction sort of shape um, technological innovation, blah, blah. But generally, um, uh, how we align ourselves with, with one of these views is going to change. I mean, we should be at least cognizant and aware of what our own perspective is. We obviously have a perspective as a creator. We might not be consciously aware of it. But it does help to know, like, this is how I view um, the, the thing I'm making. Now, another super interesting thing for me in, in, uh, in making games and something which really fascinates me is that it allows me to enjoy and appreciate and see the world around me and my relations to others in a, in a more nuanced and beautiful manner. Why? Let's say I paint. I paint a bit. Okay? Some, I do some oil painting. Um, I'm, I'm terrible at drawing, but I can, I can paint. So in phases in my life where I, I, I'm painting, text, the world around me changes. I'm looking at even a simple, boring waiting room in terms of the textures, colors, um, how, how light's falling on things, right? And I'm absorbing my surroundings in a, in a different way. Um, when I started DJing, I have no musical training, um, I, tracks started opening up. I started getting a, 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 more, a finer, more nuanced um, feel for, for the music I was listening to. And I started enjoying music more. That little sound there, that, that little beat which matches with that other beat of that track. And so when I, as game designers, what's the equivalent of this? The equivalent is that basically we abstract and simulate everything that's around us. Although um, fictional worlds are fictional, they're obviously coming from our lived experience. I can make a game about being a bunch of mushrooms in a mushroom world with mushroom mountains, but still, the, everything in that world is gonna be informed by our experience, our lived reality at the end of the day. So when, I, when I'm deeply in a uh, design uh, perspective, which has been for the last couple of years now, everything I do and everything I see, every situation, movies I watch, um, social relations, I abstract. I abstract into mechanics. How would I turn this into a board game? How would I turn this into a card game? How would I turn this into a video game? And I, it starts happening almost unconsciously, where I'm thinking of like, yeah, this, you know, okay, there's this amazing sunset. Um, I'm feeling this overwhelming little nothingness. I'm a nothing. We are all tiny, inconsequential nothings. How do I give that uh, feeling across in a board game or a video game? And not through representing a beautiful sunset and giving a sense of the sublime through representation, but giving a sense of the sublime through mechanics. 
How, how, how do we do that? Can you? Yes, you can. I believe that rules can generate any form of experience or, um, or story, which is what we're going to talk, be talking about a bit in the future. So this is another interesting thing, a design perspective on the world. Good designers will look at everything that happens around them. Uh, one one uh, Bruno Catala, a well-known French uh, board game designer, said, like, you know, that, that game that I, that really famous game, huh? came from me looking at birds resting on wires. And that, and the initial game was a game about birds resting on wires. He found that seemed beautiful or serene or whatever, right? Um, so there's this perspective that, that designers have on the world that subsumes everything, all our experience into mechanics, into game playing um, elements. Now, the more nuanced your understanding of the world and, and, and of the phenomena around you, right, the more you can dissect what you're seeing and experiencing, the easier it is to turn into mechanics, clearly, because you can read more what's going on. Similarly, um, any, any creative act, if I'm a writer, I'm also a good reader, right? If I'm a good writer, I'm also reading well, as in looking at the structures of writing, at the craft of writing, and then taking it in, looking at life in a, in a, in a particular perspective that, that, that becomes translated into my, into my craft. So this design perspective is hugely helped by also um, a lot of theory work and critical analysis, analysis that we do, right? Because we, are more, we have a more open perspective, a different lens to the world. And then we have also the design craft. And there's a lot of conceptual aspects to it and a lot of practical aspects to our craft. And the craft is really important, clearly. But it is the one part of all this which we generally obsess about and focus on. And a lot of game programs basically only focus on that. But it's the one that you can learn. It's learnable. Some people will learn it faster than others. Some people have a more innate talent. Some people's uptake is, is faster than others. But we can put time in it and it will come out. Right? We will improve. The other aspects are much harder. Like, let's look at, at this at design, at these tools that, that I just mentioned, um, as a way for sculpting the player's imagination. Essentially, that's what we're doing, right? We're using different elements, we're using mechanics, we're using representation and so on, to shape the player, player's experience and imagination. How? Essentially, we can look at every element in the game from rules, from um, sounds, images, as props. Um, this refers to Kendall Walton's um, theory of fiction, which um, pitches um, any sort of ex art or any representational um, object as a, a prop for the imagination, a prop that projects the imagination. Um, he uses this famous example of bears and tree stumps, where he says, like, well, if you have a couple of kids uh, in the forest or, or um, who have an agreement that tree stumps are going to be bears in our game of make-believe. They don't look like bears. If they did, they'd be called prompters in uh, Walton's theory. They are going to be bears by agreement. If we are involved in that game, and especially if others are involved in that game, we start projecting bareness, bare images, on the tree stumps, and they start becoming this sort of composite in our mind. And if we think about it a bit, whether a game is, has got a photorealistic kind of representation or a more blocky one, we always need to project our imagination in order to actually experience it as a world. Even if we have a very realistic looking human character, there's a lot of imaginative projection, um, Sartre, of course, that calls it, for us to actually see it, consider that being as a being, not as a, a very wonky looking bunch of polygons, right? We, we, there is that belief and that projection of the imagination. If we think of uh, Minecraft, initially we just see blocks. The first time you experience Minecraft is a couple of you know, nice blocks. Quite soon, they become landscapes. The blockiness of, the, of it kind of melts away, right? This is a, a technique used a lot in literature as well, like uh, with, in Clockwork Orange, for example, Burgess um, creates a particular language that's quite hard initially to internalize, but once you do, it becomes a lot more powerful. The reality of that world becomes more powerful. And it's a technique that some um, um, writers use in order to sort of create a, a bigger barrier, a more investment from your part, that then creates more vivid images in the mind. But whatever sort of um, 
elements we use, whether we're using real life actors or, 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 or text um, and images, those are all props for this world to happen in our minds, right? So if we take a bit of a step back from what we're doing, we are using whatever tools are at hand or whatever tools we're comfortable with or what we can afford to create these images in, the, in mind. And board games do a similar thing that the games do. They use a physical analog in this case or a hybrid analog sometimes, whatever, to create this image. But ultimately, what's really at the heart of all this is imagination, the sculpting thereof. And thus, player experience. Now, this is the one of the toughest, the toughest part of this, of this whole matrix, right? Because it is the area that we, um, we as in humans, know uh, only a limited amount about. We don't even have a clear and scientific uh, understanding of how we are aware that we are here. Well, how consciousness actually happens is something that's still uh, a matter of hypothesis at the end of the day. We, have, we know uh, experience is just very complex. Now, the better your understanding of um, psychology or perception of imagination, right, from a philosophical or a psychological perspective or sociological perspective, the finer and your, the, your toolkit is for you to know that this change in my game is going to have this effect in an implied player. Of course, you can use data, <laughs> um, as, as uh, Alex mentioned earlier. Um, you're giving my story away. But it's going to be a lot easier and better. You're going to have, you're more likely to affect changes and, and make design decisions that are going to have an intended effect on an implied player or players, because at the end of the day, we're only ever working with implied, an implied player population. When a player actually experiences your creation, they will do and interpret things in a different way. But this kind of theoretical understanding has, I find at least, when I've consulted with uh, AAA companies, when, I've, when I'm doing my work and working with other designers, gives me a much quicker understanding of like, yeah, if we do that change, this and this is gonna happen. It's instinctive and it's informed by the theoretical analysis that I've, I've done and, and, and my training. And of course, why is this important? Because we cannot just inject what we intend onto somebody else, right? That's kind of the, the obvious thing, that there's always a lot more um, um, more of a roundabout way. More ways. Yeah, so that's kind of um, so, uh, just an overview of um, the different elements and which parts and why I, I feel that um, a lot of uh, humanistic and social science research and work like really helps us. Um, and the more we understand um, these various elements, the, obviously the more informed our um, understanding is. And yes, of course, when I try to pitch this to the industry, when I try to pitch this to students who are more interested in practical work, their answer is, Bleh, I want this is dry, this is boring, this is abstract, this is useless. It is all about that. It's simply indirect. It allows you, most importantly, to see more of the matrix, to see behind things, to see behind the obvious representations of things, and looking at the structures, and how those structures, how those rules affect experience. And I'm like, I'm double over time where I should be right now, so I'm just gonna jog a bit. How? Okay, give us some practical examples. So I'll just try and, and focus in on one small um, set of theories that I've been working with, one framework, and have used quite um, directly into, into the designs. And has it been successful? It's made certain parts of the game better. <laughs> um, and its critics have definitely, it's not a coincidence that in all my games, my, all my board games, um, what critics, publishers, and the public have found really strong are the things that I'm strong in theoretically, like one-to-one. -one. It has also been a downside because I've been so obsessed. My design goals became my sort of theoretical goals. And I'm, I obviously um, missed a bit more on, the, on product design, on the actual overall fun, or some aspects are clunky because I'm obsessed these five design goals must be met at the expense of um, fluidity in gameplay, at the, at the expense of downtime, the time that it takes um, for, for play to come back to your turn and so on. So there's, there's downsides there, but obviously as I, close, I, I tweak, refine, and, and you know, um, and move forward with it in an easier way. And I'm going to focus just on game narrative. Okay, just on narrative, the tier of narrative, 
and, and how I applied this across all these games. We could look at other aspects and other theories. I'm just sort of picked on this um, because it's, it's, it's quite sort of core. Um, in a video game, a quick sort of, I'll try to round up, I don't know, five years of writing in, in two slides. In, in the video game world, um, generally our understanding of narrative is hampered by the fact that we often rely on um, narrative theories and frameworks that were developed for other media, literature and film. Okay, and, and, and our conception of narrative too often is the narrative idea that we have coming from other media. That doesn't help. Within game studies, similarly, that exists. There's more, um, more of a debate, um, but th there's also this notion that narrative is this, the classic narratology, the idea that narrative is story, the objective content, the events, the, the, the characters, and so on, and the reorganization or organization of that into a discourse, and thus narrative is a retelling, a thing that happened that I reorganize and then tell to you, which makes sense um, for, uh, for non-digital media of a certain type. Because it doesn't even, this doesn't even work for post-structuralist narratives, for example, or post-structuralist literature. But it works for Hollywood movies, for more, um, for more popular sort of um, fiction. And it, it's useful. And it can be applied to an aspect of games. But it cannot be applied to all of games, and I'll explain why. First of all, um, we too often forget that the uh, games have got um, a whole range of different ancestors. Games obviously don't come out of film and literature only. Yes, there is five minutes. <laughs> you wish. <laughs> Lock the doors. Um, <laughs> games have a, lot, a, a whole variety of ancestors, right? And an important um, ancestor is a uh, play, dollhouses, games. And what kind of story, what kind of narrative comes out of? There is narrative in dollhouse. But we never ever talk about it, right? In, in, in you can go to any GDC um, narrative talk, and the focus is always on narrative in a filmic sense. Here, the narrative is generated on the fly, and that's what we do often in video games, right? And that's the thing that most players really care about. When I interview players and in all my qualitative research, when they talk about stories, really, really rare that they actually talk about um, the story that's been designed into the game especially for more open worlds and so on. They care about the story that they, uh, that emerges from their gameplay. The, the novelty of like, wow, this thing happened. Was that scripted or not? Like, oh my God, I was walking in Skyrim and this huge dragon came over, blah, 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 blah. Right? Um, and so a basic distinction, um, a really, really simple basic distinction we need to make in, in, uh, in game narrative is that there's scripted narrative that which has been designed and placed into the game, which we can maybe analyze with, um, traditional narrative kind of models, and emergent narrative, which is the thing that comes out from our interaction with various game elements. And this is hard. This is super hard to conceptualize, and that's why I guess we often don't talk about it. Because it involves the player in, uh, in a feedback loop with the game. Uh, emergent narrative is essentially cybernetic, right? This is pre can be scripted, given to players. This only comes with elements in the game, but it's not just random experience, because the, the, the difficulty in understanding this is that we can talk then of all experiences being narrative. No. How? You just need better frameworks. Frameworks we don't have right now, but you know, we can work on. And one of them is Mary Laurie Ryan's um, take on narrative, which is not as narrative um, that's embedded inside the object, like older notions of narrative, but narrative for her is a mental construct that is activated by interaction with a textual object that has narrative. How? It's, it's activated by uh, a text that has a world, its settings, uh, characters, actions and happenings, and, and that has global changes in, in its narrative world. And she uses this to cover a transmedia kind of theory of narrative from, from books, games, and so on. What she misses out on is super important, is rules. Rules generate story, right? When we know this from role-playing games, board games make this really clear. And if we translate this into board games and board game design, um, uh, in board games, narrative, immersion, setting is all theme. It's called kind of ham-fistedly theme. And rules plus theme equals imagined narrative. And rules plus theme equals kind of the holy grail. If you're good at that, 
um, then you're going to make games that are more enjoyable than just dry Euros, um, or and more tactical and more interesting than uh, more random Ameritrash games. And you're also going to be good at making, um, working on IPs, and you're going to be sought after by publishers. So that's kind of, um, give me just five more minutes. Are you guys bored? Uh -huh. <laughs> no, it's, all right, so I can stop here, and that's sort of the kind of an overview. Uh, what I was going to do is, not going to do all of them, was apply this narrative kind of perspective as a practical example of what I've been ranting on about using theory to design and go through all the games. I won't do that because it'll take a while, but maybe we can do one. I can ask you a question about you and you can move. This is a question. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> all right, let, let's just, let me just do one. Let me just explain how I've... Uh, because I wanted to ground all this blah in something. Um, so, talking about Vengeance. And Vengeance, as I said, is a board game adaptation of revenge movies. It places you as a hero, as heroes that have been wronged by these, um, by these gangs, by these bosses and gangs. Um, different gangs have different colors. Um, and they've done nasty things to you. The nasty things you're seeing here. Chopped your finger, uh, drug-induced phobia marathon, giving you a nice bashing. Jovial. All my games are super jovial. Um, uh, and your goal is to find the, the ones that, that hurt you, that, that damaged you, and you, um, they're, they're on a table in different sort of dens, um, face down, and go and kill them, and get your sweet revenge. The more cards of the same type you have, um, but if you kill that boss, you'll get more points. If you have one card, you'll get one, um, the top uh, victory point. If you have two of the same card, and you kill them, um, you uh, suffer more damage, but also get more points. So that's um, the ties into the mechanic that addresses the downtrodden. The more downtrodden you are, the more satisfaction you get when you actually get your revenge. Um, the game plays over these, the sequence, and the, one of the challenges was that it had to have very different feels in different aspects of the game. This was a, a really big challenge. For it to feel like a revenge movie, first it had to have the sort of um, downtrodden hero getting his revenge. Okay, we sorted that. But then it also needed to have different tempos, right? Because um, you have aspects of revenge movies, which are the hero strategizing and planning and preparing, and then you have the action part, which has to be quite a different tempo. So the mechanics of one couldn't apply to the other. I couldn't make one system that universally worked, so I had to chop it up into di different kinds of turns, called montage, combat, montage. Montage is what it, it sounds like. Um, uh, and anyway, let's go through the different phases. So basically, there's three different types of turns in the game. The wronging, which start, happens only at the start. Here, you, you're drafting cards and establishing who did what to you and establishing the overall strategy of the game. You suffer the damage that they give you, and then you can go out and, and, and get them. Next up is the montage, which is basically um, you either improve um, healing, um, you uh, getting better abilities, um, or you scouting out um, the, the bosses which are sort of hiding there. Now, um, this is sort of the tactical part. Everyone's more thinky. There's quite a, quite a puzzle. And for this game to work, I got stuck initially because damage was damaging games generally. When you get hit, you get hit. But pain had to be more nuanced, right? We had to, the damage that they give you had to be split into different kinds. So I have stress damage, um, broken damage, or hurt damage. Each one of those types of damage affects one of your stats. The more damage you have, the less dice you roll if of that, that um, is governed by that particular stat. Okay? So you're seeing sort of things starting to be tied together here. Every, every rule has a fictional or thematic um, reason for it, and every little thing, every element there creates a in your head without me telling you it. Okay? Um, and then we get to the combat, which is sort of the heart of the game and what really shines. Um, basically, you have these different dens. They're, they're non-contiguous um, places. Face down boss cards. You have to find your right boss. We're all competing on the same place. And of course, I want to be the one that um, gets satisfaction. I want to be the one killing the boss that wronged me. But these douchebags have wronged a whole bunch of us, right? So you want, I want to get there before... Uh, before they do. Now here, what we're doing is we have these dice, um, and each face, this is an attack, it kills a person, this is a move, you just move, this uh, allows you to hit somewhere other than the area you're in. This is split into various areas. 
And it's fairly simple. You roll these dice to decide which ones to do in which order. Um, and you have three rolls um, uh, before the game, uh, before the combat ends, and you have a timer of three minutes. So either three, three rolls or three minutes, and the thing ends. And you, the main exciting thing of the game is that you change these dice to other results using your abilities, which you have picked up in the montage. And using simple things like reverse blade, just the name of the thing, or backflip, changes that simple mechanic into an image in your mind. And all of a sudden I'm doing, okay, I take these two, so I take this result, it becomes a double hit, a double hit can become two other hits, so I've chopped somebody's arm off and done a reverse hit backwards and killed two guys. And just by that little name and creating, so the idea here is to create a very exciting action movie kind of thing, right? And most dice-based fights are not tactical, as in you have to roll beyond a certain number, you roll a dice and then something happens. Here the tactical element comes from you having to reorganize the dice and having a time limit to do that. And it's very quick because it's simple, right? Each face does one thing because it needed to be fast paced in order to keep with the sort of genre of the game, that, of the movie that's adapting. And again, it's really weird, <laughs> but you need to try it. When you do play it, it just gets the sort of action sequence going in your head. Um, I'll stop there, <laughs> but as, if, as I'm trying to sort of get across, what I'm trying to get across is all these little elements um, create little events in the world with characters. Each area has got a name on it and it's de depicting a particular place to give it a certain sense of placeness. So basically I took that framework and just made sure that in every aspect of the game, there's always a place, there's always a character, there's always actions, right? And the tempo and emotions that I'm evoking are fitting that part of the game, that segment of the game. And another important thing in, with all my games, for this to work, for this approach to work, you need to do everything from the ground up. I don't adopt other systems. This isn't a copy of something else, or because I want to be original, because if I'm starting from the player experience and the emergent narrative as a starting point, the rules have to serve that function, which means that it's going to be unlikely that another rule set is going to work if I just tweak it. I have to create rules for it, which makes it really difficult testing-wise, because players, and, and to understand the game, players are like, what's this initially, right? It's harder to internalize, obviously. Okay, I'll stop there. And take... Um, Ask me stuff. Set up 